James, last Saturday night, most of the political world was awaiting the Iowa poll from Ann Selzer. Because every time Ann Selzer does a poll, people who know something about politics wait for it. Because uh, as 538 wrote several years ago, she may be the very best political pollster in the land. The poll was a uh, it was a bombshell of sorts. I'll give you the bottom line numbers uh, as we talk to our great guest, Ann Selzer. Pete Buttigieg surged in the lead at 25. And then Warren and Biden and Sanders were all bunched at 16, 15, and the rest of the pack was in Nebraska. Ann Selzer, what was your takeaway from this really, really fascinating poll? Well, we've been looking at the same four front runners, Al, for for most of the polls. Um, So we expected, you know, if things stayed the same, we'd see the same four. But really, we have a standalone front runner now in Pete Buttigieg and then a cluster uh, of the other three. And and those are the only ones in double digits. The next highest is 6% with Amy Klobuchar. So you really have this pack of four with one standout there. And I'll just add that the Pete Buttigieg surge, his his percentage picking him as first choice actually tripled. So it was a, a giant leap frog over the rest of the field. And and Ann, what does does his surge and what does the rest of the uh, data that you have in your poll tell us about Iowa caucus voters this year? What do they move by? What do they care about? Uh, why? What appeals to them? Well, uh, this is first of all, I think the, the 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 best word to define this caucus electorate, if you will, is kind of a quirky electorate, but is the early commitment to go to caucus. Um, there's an energy and and a, and a sense of excitement just about the caucuses generally. Normally, uh, it, it isn't until the final run-up to the actual caucus itself that we have more people saying they will definitely attend than probably attend. And you have to say one of those to get into our poll. We now have 63% saying they will definitely go to caucus. And even in the final run-up to 2008, it was 53. It was lower than that. So I think that's a really important fact to understand about what's happening here in Iowa. So, Ann, can you off the top of your head, do you know how many people voted in the uh, Iowa caucuses in 2016 and how many you expect get a rough estimate of what will vote in 2020? Well, that's the kind of number I would have looked up, James, if I'd known you were going to ask. Yeah. I think, you know, it was a shockingly big number in 2008, and I have it in my mind. That was 230, uh, 236,000 yeah. because Ann Selzer told me okay. that one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe you know the answer to the others. Less than. I'm not sure it got to 200,000 before. But you expect a, you expect a sizable increase in this cycle. Is, in, that, is that correct? Well, you know, just doing the math on having this many candidates in the state actively organizing, you know, they're they're going to have to go find new caucus goers in order to build a, a meaningful and viable group on caucus night. It's just hard to imagine, James, that that wouldn't mean uh, sort of a doorbuster on caucus night. So it's generally, and I don't know if this is factual or not, but in Democratic consultant circles, it's always been, we didn't have to run in Iowa in 92, so I'm not that familiar with it, that the Iowa caucus goers tend to be more liberal than the, than the Democratic electorate nationwide. Is there any validation? Is that, is that a valid observation or is that just some inside the Beltway myth that's not really true? Well, I, I do have some data on that. Let me Let me pull that piece of paper out. Um, we ask on the Democratic side how you would label yourself as you, I, I'll leave off the conservative part, but you could be moderate, liberal, or very liberal. And it's 19% who would describe themselves as very liberal in our last poll. And that's the way it has been running this cycle. Just about one in five who give that that big number. And more like one in three who say moderate, and more like one in three who say just liberal without going to the very liberal. So well, obviously it's liberal, the, but... Yeah, if you add the Warren Sanders vote, which I, I do in every poll I see, it's at 31. Just the two of them together. Well, yeah, yeah. Just, if you just the, took... I, I'm just assuming that's that's the very liberal block, you know? Well, it, there are very, some people who... 
It doesn't sound like it. And I would say that there are some people who who shy away from very liberal, who still like some of the things they're hearing from Elizabeth Warren. She was our front runner in the last poll. And some of them who like the, the Bernie Sanders side. So there's not a perfect correlation between how you define yourself as an ideology and, and what candidates you support, although obviously um, there's a lot there. Well, but Anne, you're leaving out what I think was one of your most fascinating findings, what do people want when they vote for someone on caucus? Are they looking for ideology, someone they agree with? We have been tracking the same question in almost every poll that we've done, which is which is more important to you personally, uh, to have a candidate win the Iowa caucuses who has the best chance of beating Donald Trump, and or is it more important that that candidate share your positions on major issues? It's two to one. It's 63 to 32 that what they really want is for somebody who can defeat Donald Trump. So the issues may not matter so much as they watch Elizabeth Warren and they think, wow, I could see her on the debate stage with Donald Trump. And, and I think she could make a go of it. Well, it it. it strikes me that the entire conversation has been how the Democratic Party is, is you know, how liberal the Democratic Party has become, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And in, in this, uh, I, I see people just want, they want to win. I mean, they want to elect a Democrat for sure, but they're more, by, by 62 to 30, 63 to 32, mm-hmm. the first thing they're looking at for is somebody can win the election which is a pretty high number for caucus growers. Well, let me add a add a data point to that, James, and that is we also asked about sort of the approach to policy and what do they think is the right approach, whether they want someone who will advocate for policies that would result in big changes, even if uh, they have a lower chance of actually becoming law, or do you want a candidate who will advocate for policies that have a good chance of becoming law, even if the changes aren't as big? And that latter one is the choice of the majority of 52%. Big changes, 36%. So you're, you hear in, in this kind of a moderating idea of, uh, of pragmatic, like let's get stuff done. Let's win. Let's get stuff done. Well, that's not what Warren and Sanders are saying. They're saying you got to be big. You got to be bold. Well, and that's um, so what I find interesting in that finding. Right. Yeah. But but that thirty two percent want it and that thirty one, it matches up perfectly. <laughs> am, am I wrong? Am I missing something here? So the thirty that that you sort of hear that number in the low thirties, mid thirties, kind of repeated yeah. throughout things. I think that's exactly right. Right. I just can't and tell I, you that it's that they that they all completely coincide and that one causes the other. And picking up on James's point, though, it, it would, I know this is shorthand and oversimplified, and you hate oversimplification. <laughs> <clears throat> and I should say, lest I, you know, anyone think there's a conflict of interest, I was privileged enough to work with Ann Selzer for eight years at Bloomberg News, uh, and uh, she taught me a lot. But it would appear that for Elizabeth Warren to win, she's got to take away <clears throat> some of that Bernie vote. Uh, how how easy, how hard will that task be? Well, she already... Um I mean, the the two are aligned. There's no doubt about it. If you look at the people who are, uh, say, Bernie is their first choice, Elizabeth Warren is the most common second choice, and vice versa. That's there. And in our previous poll, when Elizabeth Warren led, she had claimed uh, the majority, plurality vote of the people who are under 35, which is what Bernie Sanders has built his campaign on. And so there is this tension between the two of them about who is the rightful uh, person to wear the mantle. But keep in mind that there's a lot of things shifting in how she is campaigning right now, Elizabeth Warren, and what it is that she said about uh, Medicare for all and taking away people's uh, sort of demolishing the private health insurance industry um, and having to kind of back up how she said that was all going to get paid for. Um and we could talk more about that. You know, I know something about the health insurance business. No, but this is – but but let me – but it's the point I'm trying to make. But in order to win, again, admittedly shorthand, she's got to take Bernie votes. And every time she tries to modify a little bit, isn't that going to make it harder for her to get Bernie votes? 
Well, the Bernie votes are... She's in a vice. She, she is potentially in a vice, and she's up against uh, a candidate whose people really stick with him. There's a majority of them described more than any other candidate who say they're extremely enthusiastic and that their minds are made up. I mean, he's got a, a rock-solid core that it's going to be hard for anybody to take. And maybe some of that is some leftover Bernie love and resentment that uh, perhaps he should have won the Iowa caucuses in 2016. But it, it is a, a solid core that no other candidate can match. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, you say she's got, but first of all, she's splitting a block of 31, which let me that there's 69 out there for somebody else. If she, if she has this, I got to get, I got to challenge Bernie. It, it's a small, it's under a third of the vote. And I think and I think Warren's general critique is something that most Democrats agree with. I think where she went awry is chasing Bernie with specificity. And then she got she gets she gets trapped. And then she, she now she's got the, 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 the problem, which I think is a bad problem, is she and Bernie, you know, well let's say Sanders and Warren or Warren and Sanders, and they just become like the same person almost. And I don't think that if you want to, not just the, I'm not talking about the general election. I'm talking about the Democratic nomination. From what I see from Ann's numbers and what I see from numbers around the country, they're not looking for that. And and by challenging Bernie and and being in lock, trying to get in lockstep with him, you, you you're giving up too much. And you, I think her critique had real validity across a broad swath of the party that that the America had become out of balance that that the the rich were just clobbering everybody and I think if she'd have stuck with that it, it, as opposed to Medicare for all and then trying to walk that back and then the stuff on the border and mm-hmm. and i don't I don't think any of that would have been necessary for her because i I think her critique starting out would have had really broad base appeal. Well, she's going to have a hard walk back now. We, you know, we've been in this for 10 minutes, and we haven't mentioned the headline, which is Pete Buttigieg is a standalone frontrunner at 25 percent. And describe where his vote's coming from, what kind of strength he has, and do you have any sense about how, uh, how hard it is? Well, one of the things that you, when you pour into the cross tabs, you go looking for on that horse race page is, well, who has what constituency? And what is remarkable about Pete Buttigieg, and we've seen this from the very beginning, is that he has very few peaks and valleys demographically. There's a very broad base of support there. Of course, he does better with moderates. He happens to do better with the higher income people. But it's not it's not a huge, you know, it's not a giant pyramid leaping off the page. And he does less well for all of the reasons James is saying, with people who describe themselves as very liberal um, or in union households. But there's very little difference by age, by where they where you live. If you live in a city or a suburb or a town or a rural area, there's very little difference between whether you define yourself as a Democrat or an independent. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that we would normally see candidates stake out a claim demographically. And what's unusual about Pete Buttigieg is that there's a there is a broad base that has choosing him for first. Well, it's, so so uh, you know when when I think of Iowa, people think oh, you don't necessarily think of a suburban state, and no one thinks of Kentucky or Louisiana as suburban states. But but we did see some rather dramatic movement in suburban areas in the recent gubernatorial election, I was pretty involved in, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I was probably a six and a half involved in Kentucky and a nine and a half involved in Louisiana. And we saw some really dramatic turnarounds in Northern Kentucky and Oldham County and Justin Parish, Louisiana, uh, East Baton Rouge Parish. It, it in just going to the general election and I was a key state, are you starting to see some of that suburban revulsion uh, toward the Republicans in, in, in Iowa as we see in other parts of the country? Well, a, a little bit. It's it's hard to say too much about it because it's a relatively small portion of our state. What I will say is that a couple of months ago, we conducted the Grinnell College National Poll. And what was very striking is what's happening 
with suburban women, that they disapprove of Donald Trump by a two to one margin. They say they will, are almost certain or to, to not vote for him by right. a giant margin. Um, and the kicker of all of that anti-Trump sentiment is that they were more likely to say they were going to vote like by 10 points higher. So I'm certainly seeing in other data the, the shift that is happening with suburban voters and, and in particular suburban women. Well, the likelihood is that Iowa will be very, very close in 2020, as was Kentucky and Louisiana, neither which had large suburban populations, but, but provided a, certainly the margin of victory in Kentucky and probably helped pretty good in Louisiana. So even where, even where you have small numbers where the states are, you know, fairly, the bases are fairly even, uh, it can be pretty significant. That's right. That's right. And and going, you know, we talked about is, is there any trade-off between Warren and Sanders voters? Um, uh, and you pointed out how solid the, most of the Sanders support is. Is there any trade-off between Buttigieg and Biden? And how solid... At twenty five percent, how solid is Pete Buttigieg support right now? Well, I have several things to say about how solid he is not, <laughs> but but let me answer your direct question first, well, which is do that too, which is that among Biden supporters, Buttigieg mm. is the leading second choice. The same is not true for Pete Buttigieg going the other way. His supporters, their most common second choice is Elizabeth Warren. And that's why, you know, perhaps I was a little bit resistant to this idea that that Warren and Sanders are identical in voters and caucus goers' minds, because there's something about her that is attractive to the people who are who are supporting the mayor. And how solid or non-solid are Mayor Pete's supporters? So we asked a question about how certain you were that each of the top four candidates would defeat President Trump. And the only candidate to get a majority saying that, you, that they were either almost certain or fairly confident was Joe Biden. And it's still just 52%. That's the top two boxes, so kind of a low bar in feeling confident. And for Pete Buttigieg, um, it was 46%, so not a majority of it. But even more telling, Al, is that if you look at just each candidate's supporters and you look at that top box of feeling almost certain, um, Pete Buttigieg only gets 27% saying that they are almost certain that he would win. And, and to me, that was his worst number in the whole poll. For Bernie Sanders, it was 48. For Joe Biden, it was 57 so he's he's not instilling the confidence in the caucus going electorate that if nominated he could actually defeat president trump which is what they care most about right james yeah I, look I, I think i think the evidence is he's a parking spot he said we saw it we'll park here for now and we'll stay here so so we have we have in the meeting all right the consultants in the room the candidates in the room and one of the consultants saying look burn we got to get we got to get share Bernie's vote. That's the day we go up. And another consultant says, "I'm sorry, Senator Warren, but if we just keep chasing him around, we're going to limit ourselves. We can actually do better going after the Buddha judge vote because we got we, we got his 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 lead is 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 softer than it looks. And if we just keep chasing Bernie around, we're not going to expand beyond that. So I I would argue if I were in the room for the Warren campaign that we need to run a more expansive campaign and contrast her experience with Buttigieg's experience, which, you know, and again, I, I go back to her, her critique when she came out was impressive and had broad based appeal. And some jackass in that campaign kept saying, you got to go big, you got to go big, you got to chase Bernie. And I think she's caught in a vice now. And, I, and it was so unnecessary. So, James, if you were if you were in that room with the Buddha judge people now, what would you tell them, advise them? You know, I would I would say you need to do like a, some policy papers or something. Whatever I did, I think the doubt about him is the legitimate doubt is kind of gravitas. And, you know, I would look for a lot of markers of people that have gravitas that that, you know, would endorse me. Uh, because people like him, I, I think the, I, my, the way I look at him is well. A lot of people do. They like him. They they think he's really smart. He's got a different story. 
He certainly represents change. You know, the question is, you know, you're the mayor of South Bend. You know, Warren is a law professor, was a United States senator, you know, founded the Consumer Protection Agency. I, I just think she's got a lot more heft, and she's losing it by just chasing Bernie around and, and going for every ignorant left-wing thing that somebody comes up with. And I, I like Senator Warren. I, I, I wish she, she would run a different kind of campaign because what she's doing, I don't think, is necessary. And, and Joe Biden is hanging on. Why is, how's Joe Biden hanging on? Well, he's hanging on because people want to win, and he's the, the candidate that the most people think uh, has a good shot. And it's um, this poll was not a good poll for Joe Biden. And one of the things that I see happening is that, of course, he came in as a as a predominant front runner, although Bernie Sanders was challenging him for that status. But he um, as he declined in terms of the proportion of people saying he was their first choice, he was also declining in his favorability number. And one does not follow from the other. You can still like Joe Biden, but say there's another candidate I want to choose. But his his unfavorable numbers since we first started polling have doubled. He's got twice the number of people saying they have an unfavorable feeling. So there's I don't think he's wearing well. They still think that a former vice president is is their best shot. But but there's a, there are wobbly legs underneath his current status. Before we go, are there any parallels? You weren't around for Jimmy Carter. You're much, much too young. But are there any parallels between the the Buttigieg surge and uh, the actually it happened later, the Obama surge uh, 12 years ago? Well, you hear people uh, anecdotally kind of get their um, get their hearts excited about Pete Buttigieg <laughs> you know, in a the kind of a similar way that they did with Barack Obama. But you know, the I think uh, in a very important lesson is that we looked at the Obama coalition, which were young people, people who'd never caucused before, and people who identified as independent rather than as Democrats. And uh, if you looked at the history, you would say, those are three groups that are the least likely to show up on caucus night. So he's built his his future on uh, on an unpredictable set of constituencies. And yet... And yet he blew the the roof off of all of the caucus locations and, in fact, uh, won handily. So as you look at Pete Buttigieg, there's one say, poll it, that predicted that, as I remember. There, there was one. <laughs> and <laughs> and it, that was a good night for me. <laughs> uh, and so I think that while Pete Buttigieg is kind of beginning to gel, it's just the beginning of a gel. There's no this is no certain thing. James, a final thought. Yeah, I, 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 well, you know, the Democratic Party has run two change campaigns, I think, since 1980, and that only been, I don't count Dukakis so much, and that is, is 92 and 2008. All right, Biden is not a change candidate, so he's, I don't see how he can get these extra people out to the caucuses. It, it, it who's for him now, and, you know, Buttigieg is obviously a, a breathtaking change candidate, and, and Warren is, is, is also a change candidate. And I think when you run on change, you, you, you run on energy, and you, 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 you carry forward. And I, I, I just think Biden's in a, in, in a really tight spot in Iowa. And, you know, I, I don't see Bernie getting any more than where he is. And I, the, the, this level of interest and intense interest that we see, I, I think we're—, we're and our, our, our man is too smart to get, you know, wrapped up in predicting right now. I think the prediction industry needs to sit down and shut up <laughs> and let this thing unfold because there's going to be a, all, all across this process. My, my estimation is there's, there's turmoil coming. Well, Ann Selzer, <laughs> a lot of Ann, weather. Ann Selzer was a uh, uh, was a pace setter in that uh, non-prediction category. She won't predict even when the votes are in. But uh, Ann, uh, based on history, two months out. Uh, does it change a lot in the final two months? It, the most common thing to happen in our final poll in the week ahead of the caucus is that the lead changes. So, of course, I'm going to think something will change. Of course it does. Right. And, and fools, fools that are out there saying this is going to happen and it's going to be one of these three or anything like that. 
in, the, the in levels of, in, of engagement here are staggeringly high. Let's get some popcorn and watch Well, one thing we know is that Ann, that nobody ever called Ann Selzer a fool. No fool. They just called her the best pollster no. in politics, which is, you know, pr- I, I, pretty. I, I agree, and one of the best guests we've ever Man, had Man, I'll tell you. Ann, Ann, can we get Come you on, back again before the caucus? Things. Of course. Good and everyone. Well, your final your your final poll will be what that February first, the Saturday night before the caucus. That sounds about right. That sounds about right. I think yeah, we were waiting. People were waiting on that poll like we were waiting on election returns. Oh, in oh my gosh! <laughs> oh yeah, hey, it's eight o'clock. He east, and I said, "Shit, I wish I was in Central Time. I'd get the numbers at seven. <laughs> <laughs> Ann Selzer, thanks a lot. God, you're a great guest. My pleasure. Thank, great guest. Great guest. James, on the impeachment front, uh, there were really some riveting stuff this week, but no, but nothing really is a surprise. Uh, we know what it is. Trump held up much-needed military assistance for Ukraine unless they dug up dirt on Joe Biden. It's that simple. Let me just quickly run through and rebut what I think are some of the silly Republican counters. They say, hey, no military assistance uh, was really withheld because it was approved. That was month after months after Congress approved it and was, it was released on September 11th. What happened September 9th? That's when we knew about the whistleblower. They knew that was coming. That's why they released it. They say the Ukrainians never investigated Joe Biden. They were going to, but the news came out, but, you know, courtesy of the whistleblowers and others, and that's the only reason it didn't. And then they say, yeah, but this president was legitimately concerned about corruption in general, as well as Biden's son-in-law. I mean, James, it is laughable. Casinos, uh, Trump University, uh, Trump Foundation that Donald Trump was worried about. Uh, anything about corruption. And, you know, Joe Biden's son shouldn't have been there. That was wrong. It really was. But Joe Biden actually was a zealot in trying to force the Ukrainians to root out corruption. I would just say, finally, if you really want to know how bad it is for him, their chief defender, the man who's really trying to defend the integrity of Donald Trump and transparency is Ohio's Jim Jordan, who was wrestling coach there when there was a pervasive sexual abuse of athletes by a team doctor said he saw and knew nothing I understand why he sees and knows nothing now about Donald Trump. What do you think? Well, first of all, I'm stunned at how the lack of a strategy they have. They just go from one thing to another. And there was no consistency. I don't know if they tried to meet before or or anything. And I think Colonel Veneman just – he just ripped Nunez's head off. And he did the same thing. Uh, with Jim Jordan, he, you know, if you remember the, the great movie, The Kane Mutiny, when they, when they read from the fitness report, <laughs> you know, and, and he read from the fitness report that uh, Ambassador Hill had given him. And it was it was just it was just dramatic. But if, if, if I were the Republicans, I would actually say, look, let, let's stop and let's get let, let's hammer out a statement of facts here. And then I would get or I would I would have. 40 Republican senators say we believe the following to be true, that he did all of this, but we are less than a year away, and we don't believe that impeachment is the remedy. We'd be happy to censure him. Everybody knows the facts. And I think their strongest argument is, yeah, he did it, and yeah, it was inappropriate, but do you really want to exercise a political remedy within 10 months of an election? And I think that's their best case. I really do, because everything, every, every we, you know what the facts are, and the facts are just going to keep coming out and keep coming out and keep coming out. And of course, the, he it was extortion. Of course, he held it up to try to get some political gain for Biden. And the only question is, is this is is this impeachable? It's the only question. But, but there's no, there's not a single thing that we don't know. I mean, maybe there's something else to find out. I, that, that may be true, but with. with Reference to the underlying charge, we know what it is. Well, I, I think you've got mm. the best strategy. they got one big problem, though, James, uh, and that is there's somebody who will really uh, dispute that, and that is Donald J. Trump, who every day makes it worse for them and says, you know, I didn't do anything wrong, and for them to come out and say you did something wrong but it's not impeachable, he, he will yell and scream and he will make it even worse. You know what? You know, you're a if lawyer McConnell, and you understand. What's that old expression in law school that if you you learn in law school that if the law's on your side, you argue the law. If the facts are on your side, you argue the facts. Of the the table. These guys have no choice but to demagogue and but, um, and to uh, but, but, uh, divert. They have no case. If, if McConnell, and I don't know, you know, a couple other senators go and say, sir, this is the best one we'll get for you. Now, if, if you want to take a chance and go to jury, I think we got 34 senators, but I can't guarantee it. 
Now, you can get out of here with ascension. I don't think it's going to hurt you at your people. All right. But but if you do that, you know, if you want a trial by jury, I got to tell you, juries act funny sometimes. And just be just understand that your refusal to do this is going to cause a lot of angst among our caucus. Well, first of all, that, that's the only thing they can do. Well, I, I don't disagree. I just think you have to look at Donald J. Trump. First, he doesn't care about uh, causing angst in any anyone's caucus. All he cares about is himself. Right. And you can see going through that warp mind of his is going to be early October 2016. Billy Bush tapes come out and all of these same people said, you got to get out. You can't win. And I, I think that will be his attitude. Screw you. I can. I, I, I've I always been. I don't think it's going to work. But I think he's going to hurt a lot of people. But that's I, what again, do. It, it, you know, when people, if he wants to take his chance, if he if he gets convicted, he doesn't have retirement. He doesn't have anything. Yeah, I don't like. He takes the censure. But... Well, I, I, again, if he takes, they're going to be mad if, if they offer the censure and they, and they get these. And there's a, a what, exit ramp here. These people are looking for an exit ramp. I'm telling you. And McConnell is looking for an exit ramp. They, they don't want a vote. They don't want this vote. They don't yeah. want to vote, uh, and and you know the Democrats just keep forcing, but they, that that they, and they they're never going to win arguing the facts. The facts is clear as a, as a bell. There's no doubt as to what happened. And, and, and who cares about the whistleblower? Who cares about whistleblower is irrelevant? Know, never, totally, totally irrelevant. Right, totally. But but just say, if I was them, that'd be and I would all get behind that strategy. Well, uh, I don't think it's a bad strategy. I think it may be the only strategy they have. Uh, but uh, I, everything we know about Donald J. Trump is that uh, it suppose, involves— suppose, But suppose McConnell and the Republicans say, do what you want, but we're going to do this. Yeah, well, they, they're not going to, first of all, them, but... given the problems they have, they're not going to vote to impeach him. They'll vote to censure him. They'll do it. And what he'll do is he'll just make it harder for him because he'll cause problems for a number of them. And it's it's just—I mean, I think that's what's going to happen. We also, James, I mean, that that is—I think that's the most likely— situation, the most likely scenario on January 10th, pick a date, if you will. We don't know what else is going to come out in the next six weeks. You know, so therefore, it's very hard to predict what the situation will be in in, in, in five or seven weeks. If, if I was them, I, I, if I were them, I'd, right now, would get 40 sentences. That, you know, that's what Huey Long did when they impeached him. He got one more than, the, the you know, one third. And he put a thing out that we're not going to vote no matter what. You get 40, say, we'll vote for a censure. We're not voting to convict. It's an entire waste yeah. of time. And why don't we get you, on with the election? You, you, you're right. It's wrong. But let, let the public decide. We're giving them the wrong. You made facts. the case. I just don't think you've persuaded Donald J. Trump. But you can still, you can, you know, you still have a couple of weeks you to try. without persuading him. Huh? Yeah. They, you, don't, you don't have to persuade him. Don't, yeah. Let him go. You know, I mean, the hell with it. We gotta, they got to save five, six sentences. Well, I, I think if they are going, look, this is so far off. We don't know what's going to happen, and we really are engaged in just wild conjecture. But they don't have no strategy. But this they is, they oh, don't have a strategy. Ahead. That strategy, I'm not sure that's a good strategy, except it's better than anything else they got. Uh, because they're in a, I mean, all you have to do is look at Jim Jordan and John Ratcliffe and Devin Nunes and that, I don't know where they got that lawyer from, uh, and that lawyer. And it really is um, even. You know what? They don't have anything. They, they don't have a strategy because because he's guilty is the day is long. Just admit the guilt, admit the time frame, and say let's take it to the to the voters, yeah. and we're just wasting time. If they do that, and people say why not? That's a good enough answer. Good idea, good idea. But Donald Trump never admits guilt. Uh, but we'll be back in just a minute with Christy Harvey and her fabled numbers. Okay, James, uh, Vegas used to have Jimmy the Greek. Uh, we have Christy Harvey, the numbers lady. Uh, go ahead. Stick us with some numbers, Christy. We're going to have short. <laughs> this is a lightning round. We're going to have short answers. Yeah, lightning round. Hey, fellas, I've got three numbers for you today. The first one is five. The number five is the number of trips that Donald Trump took to try and rally, can, uh, rally for candidates in both Kentucky and Louisiana, both of whom lost. So I know both of you charge a lot of money to give really good advice to candidates and and people looking to do this well. So um, give a little for free. What would you say to a candidate who was looking to have Donald Trump come stump for them in the future? James. Uh, All right. I think uh, I'd seen before where Trump coming in actually helped. So I think he helped uh, Roy Moore when he came into Alabama. I think he he, he hurt Connor Lamb when he came to Western Pennsylvania. But I know he made a difference. In, in the uh, Ohio, the 16, I guess it was. 
And I think he helped Rusponi, and I think he helped keep John Bell below 50 in the first round. However, an interesting thing happened in Louisiana is they were on alert. And, of course, Duke endorsed Rusponi, so they did, you know, Duke, Trump, Rusponi, all the same. And they used it a lot, and it was water cooler conversation in urban African-American urban areas and, and rural areas in the state. So I actually think in this one in this instance, I think the Democrats finally got smart. And he came in, and, and whatever extra votes he got for them, uh, the Democrats got extra votes from, from, from their constituency, their base. And, and it's pretty clear he came to Louisiana three times. He made it all about himself. The, the interesting thing, in the era of Trump, at least Bevan and uh, Rusponi and other places I've been, the Republicans don't campaign anymore. They don't go. They don't go like walk around the courthouse or talk to the chamber of commerce or go to the Qantas Club or do anything. They just bring Trump in and they completely nationalize the election. It's not about roads or schools or or, or, or anything else. It just he he just nationalizes the whole election and it it backfired on him twice. Yeah. James, you know better than I that these uh, states aren't moving blue. They're not even moving purple. They're still pretty deep red. But if this does suggest, uh, as you just said, that Donald Trump may turn out as many Democrats as he does Republicans, that has that has real significance uh, for next year. Uh, you know, I'm I think there are a lot of non-college educated whites who did not vote last time who Trump can reach. But uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Christy's got another number. Yeah, I do, and and I'll throw that out to our war roommates on Twitter at at Politics War Room. Uh, to find out if you were running for office, would you want Trump to come stump for you? I think that's a good question to uh, to ask people. But I got a if number. You're a Republican, and you're a Republican. Uh, got another number for you though. This number is zero, and I just need you guys to kind of explain this one to me. Zero is the amount of taxes FedEx is on the hook for in 2018, thanks to the Trump tax cut. So my real question is, why is FedEx paying less taxes than I am? But also, just what does this mean? How did this happen? They're even paying less taxes than Warren Buffett's. Uh, secretary. Uh, that that bill was an absolute disgrace. Uh, and that New York Times story was just a terrifically reported piece. But what's really outrageous, is not only is FedEx that lobbied like mad for this bill, not only are they not paying any taxes in 2018, but what they said when they lobbied for the bill is, you know what, if you cut our taxes, not to zero, but you cut our taxes, we'll invest and we'll create lots of jobs. What that Times story proved was that they have actually invested less and created fewer jobs. And that money that they got, that zero taxes they're now paying, that money is going to stock buybacks and increased dividends. The rich get richer. The rest got crumbs. James, any recourse? Yeah. Get a Democrat in office and fix this. Is anybody surprised by this, by the way? I mean, it was good reporting and and everything, and it, it showed direct linkage. But I, I bet you that there are 300 simpler corporations that, that are in the same thing. And, of course, all, none of it went to, you know, research and development or hiring more people or expanding the, the, the corporate infrastructure. It just went into stock buybacks and executives' pockets. I mean, of course that's what happened. You guys know me. I'm the idealist, the, the naive in the room. It surprised me, I guess. I, I wasn't expecting it. Well, I'm it, not but... surprised that they didn't pay taxes. But Fred Smith, the chairman of uh, FedEx, was the prime lobbyist. Uh, for this bill and the prime person who said the prime lobbyist for the business. Side, yeah. Prime person who said, boy, it'll create lots of jobs. All right. I got one more number for you. And it's another FedEx one. This time FedEx field. Ten. Ten dollars is how much you could buy tickets to the Redskins game at FedEx field this weekend. Uh, that is the same as a price of uh, a beer at FedEx field. It's also uh, parking there is 50 bucks. Ten bucks for an NFL game. Um, Al, have have the Redskins lost Washington? Well, you know, I spent years, years and years trying to get Redskins tickets. I remember that. There was a waiting list. And mainly thanks to their then terrific coach, Norv Turner, I finally got them. In 1997, I was so happy. I got a couple tickets, and I went for a while. And then a few years ago, I wanted to get out. It was so bad, and it was almost as hard to cancel as it was to get in. This is one of the worst franchises in professional sports. They play at one of the worst stadiums. In Washington, they used to, this whole city used to be galvanized by the Redskins. They now are yesterday. The Nationals are today and tomorrow. Yeah, I think that Capitals, too. I mean, I'm not much of a hockey fan. And Tom Boswell had a column that everybody listening to this podcast should read. I mean, the thing is not just that they're bad, all right? A lot of bad. The Lions are bad. The Dolphins are bad. The Jets are bad. You know, Giants, I'm sure, are not very good. It was how good and how powerful Redskins in, in like 1995 was maybe the most valuable franchise in professional sports. Right. I mean, they, they were 
They were golden in Washington. Tony Kornhauser famously said if, in, on his radio show, you know, talk radio show, he said he, if, if he let the callers dictate the show, they would talk about the Redskins 365 days a year. They'd never talk about the Wizards, the Capitals, or the Nationals. It, that's just not true. I mean, you know, and there were all these stories about, you know, all of the, the power brokers, mix, you know, rubbing elbows with the, the cab drivers and, you know, how diverse their fan base was and everything. And it's now, it's, it, I never liked them at all. I don't, I don't like their colors. I don't like their racist-ass nickname. You know, I, I, don't like the, I don't like the history of the franchise. I, having said that, any Redskin hater is just in its glory now. I mean, they're beyond, they're not even worth hating anymore. I mean, think of, have you ever seen a sports franchise just fall that far? No, no. There, have been, there, have been, there may have been owners as bad as Dan Snyder, but never one that took over such a treasured franchise who has fallen so far in 20 years. 20 years. Look at the Redskins from 1974, or 1975 to 1995, and then look at them the 20 years under Danny. It's it's remarkable. Well, and you right. guys are right. We've got the Nationals and we've got the Caps, but don't forget the Mystics. Don't forget the Mystics. Okay, numbers, Harvey. Uh, back to Vegas. James, uh, before we leave today, uh, let's just have a back page. I'm going to do something different. This is we talk about a lot of downer things. I'm going to give I'm going to give kudos a cheer. And the cheer is going to go to the audience at Jazz Blues Alley Sunday night when a guest unexpectedly walked in and the whole place, this is a, you know, a jazz um, uh, alley, and the whole place stood up and cheered. It was Ambassador Jovanovic after her incredible testimony. Yay, yay for the Jazz Blues Alley, folks. Well, I, along that line, uh, when Colonel Veneman finished his testimony today, I'm just reading, I didn't see it. He got a he got an ovation from the people in the audience, and uh, you know it just at at some point it 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 makes you feel good about being an American, knowing that they have people like this in this country that just are, are patriots and will, will come and rise to the occasion. And we we're, we're seeing this time after time after time. I mean, just when America needs heroes, you know, here come some heroes along the right. way, and it, it may, it's, it's kind of heartwarming. Get down on your hands and knees, and uh, thank God for the deep state. Okay, James, uh, this has been fun, uh, and uh, I'll see you again next week. You bet.